So this, this talk in slant is going to be a little bit different. Um, this uh, talk is more laminoplasty versus multi-level anterior cervical fusion. So I think uh, Hyung's talk kind of focused on looking at more a hybrid approach disc replacement with a fusion versus an actual four level, three level fusion. When I think of multi-level disease, I think three, four level disease. Um, I don't necessarily disagree with doing hybrid operations. My struggle is always getting any kind of authorization for hybrid disease. hyung has got cash paying patients. I live in Medicare. The average age is like 105 here. So uh, it's, it's so difficult to get this kind of stuff approved. So my talk is gonna be more about um, the literature comparing multi-level anterior cervical fusions not necessarily hybrids um, to posterior laminoplasty. So, oh, I see. All right, good. 57-year-old gentleman. This is a guy I took care of a few years ago. Weakness in the arms and legs, balance problems, fine motor skill problems. Um, so from my standpoint, this is three, four level disease. Um, and we're really talking about patients that have a positive K line, positive posterior spinal line, people that aren't uh, massively kyphotic, or with a huge uh, plumb line, minimal instability, minimal degeneration. To me, this is the ideal patient for a posterior laminoplasty. And I would uh, uh, debate the multi-level ACDF versus laminoplasty in this situation. Uh, when I was training, and if laminoplasty is not an operation that you do, and it was not one I did when I came out of training. When I came out of training, everyone got the uh, Rothman Institute special C3 to C6 laminectomy, C3 to C7 fusion. I didn't see a, a single laminoplasty actually. Um, picked up laminoplasty one or two years into my training. Um, and I think there are still very few people doing it. Recent survey looking at trends over the last 10 years, there's been a 300% increase in ACDF and anterior procedures with a flat lining of laminoplasty. And there are many different reasons for that. But to me, this de debate is between multi-level anterior cervical fusion versus laminoplasty. Again, not necessarily hybrid, which uh, I'm not sure how we get approval for. So posterior approaches, good for multi-level disease, OPLL, congenital stenosis. You guys know the contraindications. To me, there are two advantages of the posterior laminoplasty, and it simply comes to outcomes and complications. Um, so first, uh, there are not that many studies. There are certainly no studies looking at hybrid procedures versus laminoplasty. There are a few looking at ACDF versus laminoplasty. Here's 52 patients. The outcome of multi-level ACDF versus laminoplasty, JOA rate recovery is very similar. The ACDF had more complications um, and there was certainly better range of motion uh, with the laminoplasty, which you would expect because it's a motion preserving procedure. Here's a good meta-analysis, um, 1,351 citations. They looked at six criteria. Again, really no difference in outcome, uh, but in terms of complications, even when you look at C5 palsy rates, more complications with an ACADF than laminoplasty. For those of you that do laminoplasty, very elegant procedure, very little blood loss in my experience. Patients do not have a lot of posterior neck pain and exchange for the dysphagia rate for multi-level anterior cervical surgery uh, is certainly worth it. Um, here's a more recent meta-analysis. Again, no difference in outcomes. Um, ACDF, a little bit lower blood loss, which I probably agree with. Um, laminoplasty, better range of motion. So for me, this is a range of motion operation. I agree that with a hybrid procedure, two-level cervical disc replacement, two-level fusion, um, you will probably maintain some range of motion, but it's probably not as good as not fusing any of the levels with a laminoplasty. So my, my, um, my hypothesis is that there really is no preservation of range of motion with fusion or with hybrid or not as good with hybrid. So here's Hyung, very famous. I don't have any spinal news bios on me. By the way, I like this caricature. I like the American flag. I don't know why there's a rabbit in the background next to golf, but um, a greater acceptance of motion preservation technology will push the envelope for innovators. But it turns out the best motion preserving technology is the laminoplasty. It avoids any fusions in the front. And this is not pushing the envelope. Japanese have been doing this forever. So let's look at range of motion. A lot of people say, well, you don't really get preserved range of motion with a laminoplasty. 502 patients, three-year follow-up, 88% of range of motion preserved compared to pre-op, which is outstanding. This is one of my first few lamino first laminoplasties. And I, I just want you to notice up here, I'm going to point this out later. This is a C3, 4, 5, C6 laminoplasty. Flexion extension, clearly great range of motion. But notice C2, 3 here. There's not quite a 
quite as much range of motion at the C23 junctional level. Um, over the last several years, I've changed my technique for laminoplasty. This is digressing a little bit, but I think it's important because it's good for preserving range of motion. Um, focus on the, the C3 lamina here. Previously, uh, as I showed you in the prior uh, film, I would do a C3 laminoplasty here. Now I don't do a C3 laminoplasty, I do a C3 laminectomy. And it turns out that does not lead to increase in kyphosis, but what it does allow you to do is avoid impingement of the spinous process and the lamina on the C3 level. So it allows you to kick back C23 more, gaining more motion. It also allows you to dissect C2 less because you don't have to plate C3. Um, I dissect out just 18 millimeters for the spinal cord at C3, and then more so for the trough and laminoplasty at the levels below. So here's uh, something specifically looking at C3 laminectomy versus C3 laminoplasty. If you do the laminectomy, you get less bony impingement, better range of motion, less neck pain, um, overall better outcomes. So in terms of preservation of motion, um, think about doing uh, the laminectomy as well. Adjacent level disease, I don't care if you're doing a hybrid or if you're doing um, multi-level cervical fusions, you're always gonna get adjacent level disease, um, probably greater than 3% per year per level, even with hybrid constructs. And I have not heard of adjacent level disease with laminoplasty. Sometimes you hear of post-laminoplasty kyphosis, but really you don't hear of adjacent level disease. I like to avoid that. Obviously non-union rate, if you're doing a multi-level up to 30, 40%, even if you're doing a one or a two level in a hybrid, probably up to 10 to 20%, you're never gonna see non-unions with a laminoplasty. Also, posteriorly, less incidence of derotomy, particularly with OPLL. Um, I saw some uh, AC, ACDF, CDR combinations in Hyung's talk as C3445. I don't like my patients that get G-tubes, maybe Hyung does, um, but for me, I'm, uh, I, I try to avoid the G-tube. What about sagittal alignment? Some people say you should do fusions to preserve the or improve SVA as well as improve lordosis because uh, positive SVA is a predictor of poor recovery. Um, great paper, 60 patients, multi-level ACDF versus laminoplasty. It turns out that the ACDF has a greater C2 to 7 Cobb angle at three days post-op. But when you look at a year and a half, the Cobb angle in the SVA of an ACDF is actually identical to the laminoplasty, which is counterintuitive. Sometimes I see slight kyphosis and I say, well, I wanna do an ACDF to pitch this patient back. It turns out long-term follow-up because of compensatory changes at the adjacent level, the SVA and the Cobb is actually the same between laminoplasty and an ACDF. Lastly, I had a great face of Hyung here, but we just couldn't Photoshop it. It was him looking so angry and so happy. ACDF, six to 12 weeks in a collar, laminoplasty, two weeks in a soft collar. Um, how do I go back here? Here we go. So uh, the worst thing about a laminoplast, how do I go back? How do I go two slides back? You just click on the bottom left there. Bottom left. I don't see bottom There's left. There's a little arrow. Oh, I don't even see my arrows. I got screwed up. Can you go four slides back? You bet. You can just advance it. I'm almost done. So there is one, uh, go one back. Okay, so this is the worst part about uh, laminoplasty. It pays not well. So 34 work hour views for laminoplasty. It turns out if you do the cervical laminectomy, you pick up the laminectomy code as well, which is kind of nice because otherwise you wouldn't. But C3 to C7 ACDF, that is a great code. You get the anterior fusion, you get the multi-level, you get the prosthetic cage device, you get the anterior instrumentation. So uh, definitely more RVUs for, uh, for an ACDF. And we got to pay for uh, Young's fancy cars with the, with the multi-level surgeries. And what about the reimbursement costs? Well, the nice thing about the hospital cost is 2,600 bucks for a plate with mini screws. You do a three-level ACDF, four-level plate, screws, cages, 8,300 bucks. So with value-based care, it may make up the difference, but um, this is an operation that's $6,000 more than a laminoplasty. So in summary, I think you get similar outcomes, fewer complications. I like the range of motion. I think it's probably even better than a hybrid construct. It maintains your sagittal alignment. You get less collar wear. It's cost-effective. It sucks because you don't get paid as much. But I think if you don't have laminoplasty, in your armamentarium, particularly when compared with a posterior cervical fusion, let alone a hybrid, uh, you're missing out on a really great operation.
Thank you.